Good morning to everyone tuning in. Um, my name is Shahida and I'm the curator of the exhibition and exercise of meaning in a glitch season. 
Um, currently on show at the National Gallery um, and organizes part of the proposals for novel ways of being initiative. Today we're continuing the artist talks for the exhibition. Before we start and for anybody who just tuned in, let me begin um, by introducing our speakers today. Um, so first we have Priya Gita Dia, who is an interdisciplinary visual artist. Her practice is oscillates on multifaceted narratives of phrase, identity politics and the in-between. Unpacking her colloquial experience of oppression and the surveillance ma manifesting from within and now, she simultaneously subverts and highlights the brown condition with her goal of the eagle. In 2019, uh, 2019 she was presented with the Impart Award by Art Outreach Singapore. And we have Sofia Dominguez, uh, who is a young visual artist. Uh, their practice explores the discomforts of the female body through performance, video, and photography. They draw inspiration for their own writings and experiences or other literary texts. In 2020, Dominguez was awarded Villagetorian of the School of Art and Design in Nafa and founded Buwan Art Collective, organizing a series of online exhibitions called Buwan Performance Project. And there we have Taisha Khan, who is an artistic force <laughs> known for her versatile acting and powerful writing. Her practice centers around extracting and condensing truth and finding interesting ways to present it in order to facilitate understanding. Her upcoming works include Directing for King by Jarrah George, Solomon S. Bob, The Necessary Stage Playwrights, Cove Showcase, Performing in Sleep, Sleepwalkers by Sui, and drama, Dramaturging for Part WH are the substations we are not going back, we are coming around. You can follow her on Instagram at Taisha Khan. So alongside Nabila Abbey and Sandia Pillai, Sophia and Taisha, are the collaborators who work with Noralia on realizing the short film Sekali Lagi Siapa Nam Kamu, which translates as once again, what is your name? Again, both their works are on view in the exhibition exercise of Mini English season at the National Gallery of Singapore. Um, so, the last time we better talk with um, Eli Minju, um, you know, she asked this question. I think it's important for us to you know, begin with that as well. Um, you know, it's been three months since we opened the exhibition. To start off, how are you three feeling at the moment? I'm neutral. <laughs> I think when I first like read the question and it said three months, I was like, three months? No. I thought it was like it was like last month or last week. So I just I feel like time doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I also feel very like stuck in time, sort of lost in my own. <laughs> it can be three months. Yeah. I thought it was like a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's been a very challenging period for all of us. So, and, you know, we also. I think we had this joke as well. Like we're in this. No, but the thing is that you know we we had this conversation, this joke that you know we're in the liminal space between yeah. like <laughs> the exhibition, yeah. sleep season, and time passes. So, which is where we are right now. Um. I mean, it's, um, you know, thank you all for being here with me also. I think to, to start off the conversation, it's important for me to, you know, um, recall a bit to the audience on the curatorial premise of the show. Um, and one of the three elements, the three elements that I tried to bring out was thinking about making spaces for other worlds to exist alongside ours, to subverting the absurdity of our everyday now, to thinking about new pathways of action. I choose to think that with Nora Lia's words, Kali Lagi, Siapa Nama Kamu, and Priya's Long Live the New Flesh, I felt it came through the third point in this need to exercise or contemplate new pathways of action. So of all the works in the exhibition, the two works were very much in line in thinking about the state of our identities. Um, considering this, can we start off with Priya, maybe introducing your work a bit? So um, in my series of works, um, it's titled Long Live the New Flesh. It's actually a crossover between um, Sandro Botticelli's um, painting and Nicholas Provo's video work, which is also titled Long Live the New Flesh. Um, I was very interested in kind of like encapsulating memory, um, feminine agency, race and representation, and identity politics, um, and transferring it into sort of like digital consciousness. So in the series of work, it actually, in the series of works, it actually starts off with the wax work. Um, so I wanted to kind of like bring about um, my own childhood memory of myself using a passport photo and just trying to kind of like encase it within wax. And on the surface, I decided to kind of like engrave um, the three graces. It's sort of like uh, a, take or, or a take on juxtapositioning um, my relationship with um, westernization. 
um, and then um, in if you see the painting itself, it's two weeks with, within the whole idea of primavera, so the season of spring. And I was trying to look into um, sort of like Singapore's climate or like you know the environment I was brought up in, and kind of like bring it as well into the works. So you can actually see the idea of um, the green environment or SG's climate um, into the next work. Um, and I wanted to kind of like bring about the self or bring to life the self um, by modeling myself into a, a CGI graphic. And I tried to, I, I wanted to bring uh, or sort of like activate the self and the environment um, through the act of breathing. So when you look closer into the work, you can actually see, you know, the figure actually breathing. Um, and then by referencing into Nicholas's work, um, Long Live the New Flesh, I sort of like took on the reference of um, cinematic language. Um, so I kind of like intersect the whole idea of CGI graphics with data moshing, but into sort of like um, replicating my lived experience. Yeah. Um. I think before I extend a question to Taisha and Sophia, <coughs> I think it's important to also give an introduction on Noralia, Sekali Lagi Siapa Nama Kamu. Um, so, Sekali Lagi Siapa Nama Kamu, uh, which translates as once again, what is your name, uh, is a collaborative multimedia piece showcasing video recordings of Siapa Nama Kamu, um, what is your name, which was first performed in 2019 and Sekali Lagi once again, was produced specially for this exhibition and consists of the four collaborators, including Taisha and Sophia. Both performances take Chua Miyake's iconic painting, National Language Class, painted in 1959 as a starting point, drawing on this image of a group of students of different ethnicities learning Malay, the newly designated national language after Singapore attained self-governance. The performances articulate the pain and long-lasting effects of imperialism through historical texts, original spoken word and pieces and songs. This work presents a contemporary take on the painting with a new cast reflecting the current days asking the question, Siapa nama kamu? Um, as some of you may know, um, the same name, Sapanam Kamu, is also the title of one of the National Gallery's permanent exhibitions downstairs where Chua Miyati's painting is situated. So for Sophia and Taisha, would you like to share how you came to collaborate with Nora on this? And how was the collaboration process like for both of you, especially to be filming the work in a, in a building that has its own colonial history? Yeah. Um, how Nora and I connected was uh, from her open call for um, <clears throat> Filipina and Filipinex performance artists and so yeah like we started from there and um, for me collaborating with the other four artists was uh, we bonded really quickly and, and, <laughs> and really well I'd say I know I'm the youngest <laughs> and like out of all of them but um, but they all like created a safe space. Oh, we all created a safe space for each other. Um, and and Nora was very um, uh, like she took care of us a lot uh, and very wary of our boundaries and uh, wow. yeah, which was I think very important um, in this process also. Yeah. For me, how Nora and I connected was she texted me. She was like, girl, I have a proposal for you. <laughs> then before she can finish, I already said, yeah, sure. Whatever it is, I'll do it. And she was like, but I'm just like, no, no, no. No, but I will do it. <laughs> just tell me. So that was how we connected. So yeah, I already said yes before I knew what the project was about. Then, yeah, the collaborative process, I remember what she mentioned. Like, one of the most interesting things that happened was at the very first meeting, we had a Zoom meeting. She asked us what are our boundaries. So like no text after this time, for example, is a boundary. So she told all of us to set our own boundaries so that and I guess that gave us all immediately like a sense of ownership of what we were doing and that we were being taken um seriously and that we were being respected la, as collaborators. Yeah. yeah. The collaboration process was like I remember there were two Zoom calls. And just the Zoom calls were funny already because people like were late, people like forgot or something. Yeah. <laughs> so like we already like get to know each other from that. Then she also asked us to like contribute words or songs to the text. So actually some of what you see in the film 
like it's text contributed by us so like we wrote them or we sourced them or it's songs for Sandhya for example it's a song from like her childhood like a prayer song that her family sings so it makes her feel safe right. yeah so yeah we all had like quite a bit of input into the film you want to share a bit about the choreography as well? I mean, you all also had some input in that, right? Yeah, including oh, yeah. Uh, like <laughs> with the text, we also like added in gestures that we would want. Um, so, like each of us had like an individual call with Nora mm. to sort of arrange that the whole setting, I think, and the whole like scene for each of us and where each of us play in that specific scene. Yeah, like for yeah. Abila, she came up with like her set of gestures, like the photo, and then we all mirrored it. For me, I didn't have a gesture. I just told like um, Nora, I want to squat. <laughs> That's the word. I have no gestures in mind, but I know I want to be squatting in front of the painting. It's just like okay, <laughs> sure, yeah. let's make it happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, even going through that process, I mean, it's, it's great that Nora actually had set those boundaries, you know, there's that relationship as well. Mm. But would you feel like it's even more important now, especially, um, you know, having to do a film in the middle of the pandemic? I mean, when we did that film, was it was in August, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, there were some restrictions. Um, how did you feel about that also? I think it was supposed to be a live performance even, but we couldn't yeah. do it. Because, cannot lah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did I feel? Uh? Don't know how did you feel? <laughs> um, I feel like the boundaries are more personal than, <laughs> than the restrictions. Yeah. yeah. I guess it gives us a sense of agency, like a... Not, I want to say false sense of control over what is happening, but yeah. like, you know, it makes you feel safe. And I guess that's important in a time when you just... You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Actually, was there a reason why you guys chose yellow as the fabric? Nora chose it because it's like the royal colour of the Malays. Like for example, Brunei's flag is almost entirely yellow. Mm. Yeah, I think that was the main reason. Yeah. Is there anything else? I think that's mainly it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was that specific shade of yellow that is like royal. Yeah. Mm. Okay, continuing to the discussion as well, like, you know, for, for Taisha, you, you are an actor. And uh, Sophia as well as Bria, you both also translate your practice in performance art. And for both works, the presence of the body is quite evident. Um, for Skali Lagi, there was obvious connection to embodying the ancestor. Uh, mm. And for Priya's Long Live the New Flesh, it was quite the opposite because you're envisioning a future where the body is articulated in digital consciousness. Can I ask you three to share more about that process of embodying or performing these bodies? Um, and what it means to you, especially now with the heightened discourse and amplifying underrepresented narratives? Mm. For me, the process of embodying is sort of like the insertion of um, the psyche into digital consciousness or even a character. Um, I was try I was trying to model the CGI figure after my own self, um, and I realized that you know this figure has like an absence of my lived experience. So how was I trying to go in, or convey that sort of like experience to you know this figure? And when I look at it, um, I would say that. Um, when when I'm trying to what I'm trying to convey is that when I when I create these goal figures or like you know when I'm trying to sort of put goal into a, into a context I'm trying to bring about my goal alter ego here. So I when I realized that um, this figure is like you know it's not really me but it's also after me. Um, that's when I decided to bring in the whole idea of glitch. Um, when I look back into my lived experience, I see that, you know, it's never a, a linear thing and by conveying um, that process of glitching this figure, I was trying to like configure the idea of corrupting this embodiment. Yeah. Um, for me, 
for me, reading it in this, in, um, from the performance uh, lens, and from what I understand, uh, the bodies Nora choose to present in the film is, is very important and very deliberate, I think. Uh, having all of us be um, like, uh, like a representation from different cultures and ethnicities of Southeast Asia and different forms of brown women. <laughs> um, that, that being very important part uh, to the film. Uh, as we were also representing ancestors of the land and of the region, um, but also we are the ancestors to the future um, people who do see the, the film also. So I think like that representation and that very deliberate choice was uh, like, yeah, very deliberate lot in, in my um, sense. I think yeah. when you like, populate like Panora's work, like when you populate a world with bodies that are usually not as represented, it gives like rise for, how do I say it? Like if there, if there can only be space for one brown woman body, then you only see one brown women body and you might think like okay this is what brown women are like mm -hmm. but when there are five of us you can see the differences in our body the differences in the way we speak the differences in the way we carry ourselves and then you know that there is more to us than just that one stereotype or that one archetype that you have in your mind yeah yeah so i mean we come in all shapes sizes and mm -hmm. like ethnicities like yeah even the two Indian girls are very different, like different ethnicities. Like there's one who is like a huge mix, like Sinhalese, Tamil, this and that. I can't remember everything already. <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, you know, it's not just like one Indian. Like India is a big country. There are so many like sub-ethnicities. So to have that representation and have two different ethnicities of Indian women, yeah. even, is just for me like a big thing. But in terms of, you want to talk about embodiment and my actor training, then like... Um, so we learn in actor training that there are three types of body. Like for one person, you have your personal body, like your normal body, the one that you just chill, like when you're at home in your pyjamas. And then there's your actor body, which is like the, the neutral one that is ready to go anywhere. So it's the activated body. And then there's a the character body, which is when you take on a character and how your character moves, how your character sits, how your character stands, stuff like that. So, yeah, for Nora's work, we are supposed to be the ancestor. Um, but the ancestor is us, for the future generations that will come to watch this footage. So it was a bit like, I actually don't know which body I'm using. Because <laughs> it's like, it's definitely not my relaxed body. Because once there's a camera or there's a performance, your body is not going to be your pajama body. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but is it a character body? Is it the actor body? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Also, for my work, adding to that, like performing the body um, via CGI, it sort of like also elevates or like amplifies the, the whole idea of facial recognition. Um, or even surveillance, where in reality, when I were to, if I were to stand in front of like a thermal scan, it, I have to like scan myself twice or thrice to be, be recognized. And I realized that my face or my facial feature is not as recognized as a prototypical. It's um, a face. Yeah, it's a face. <laughs> so the whole idea of like oh that itself is a glitch in real life. So why not bring it to on screen? Like you know, right. it's all it's all glitched. Like you know, I'm not recognized. Um, my face is not recognized in technology, right. so right. that whole idea of glitch comes through. Like, I basically stand in front of a thermal scan and like it doesn't scan, it doesn't read my fever. It it's says like, like yeah, even with the mask on, it just yeah. doesn't recognize. I have to like you know do it two or three times just to get it scanned, or like even even if it's like um, the thermometer gun, the one that puts on your face. It, it doesn't get, you don't, I mean, the reading always comes low or high, yeah. So there's the idea that technology is like neutral, but it's not, right? Maybe not so much of the gun, but more of the, the, the one that has the facial recognition. Yeah. 
on it. The one you have to step really close yeah. to. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. I, I didn't have that experience. So really? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for sure. I mean, like, I think I've read about how technology, like, sometimes, you know, the auto hand wash, people with darker skins, they don't get red as that there's a person that trying to wash their hands. Mm. But once they take, like, a paper napkin, because the paper napkin's white, right? Right. The thing is like, oh, it's a person. So like, I think skin color might play a part. And we happen mm. to be fairer, yeah. so we don't have that problem. Well, that's interesting. I mean, like, I, mean, I guess in, in that context of, of, of you know, futurism as well, like, and the future and how, of course, even to be recognized is only within the privileged few. Um, and I think that's, you know, worldwide conversation on this as well. Mm. Um, but you know, going into that conversation also of the glitch uh, for Priya, <coughs> um, you know, we both we both also discussed a lot about how your work was directly embodying the glitch and mm. responding to the title of the show. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people have asked me about the data washing technique and mm. what is it? What is data washing? Um, how is it done? Is it a randomized process, or did you have to guide it along to get the visuals you wanted? Mm-hmm. And most importantly, what is the glitch that you know you were attempting to articulate? And I think you mentioned a bit, but maybe you want to spend a bit more here. Yeah, for me, the glitch is sort of like a visual metaphor of my experience. Um, in reality, um, my experience is not a linear one, so might as well just put sort of like this glitchy effect into the work itself. So what I'm trying to convey is the glitch is basically all the inequalities, I would say, that I have faced. Um, but I try not to make it so direct. I try to put it... I mean, the whole the glitch in the work is very violent when you look at it. Yeah. There's a lot of like undoing and doing of the body, but it comes together and then it breaks apart and then it comes back together. Um, and I was trying to convey um, in a language that... sort of like in a poetic language about, you know, uh, what I was trying to say. Um, when you look at like um, the blue screen of death, um, it, it conveys this system error. Um, mm-hmm. So I was trying to convey that sort of error with my experience. Um, yeah. And for data moshing, it's basically, uh, I would say it's done with sort of, sort of an intention to create an error, but the results that you get is always um, not predetermined or like it's very unintentional so you're never know, never going to know what the result is going to look like um, and I and I kind of like that sort of unexpected an unexpected quality to the work um, where I had no control to how the glitch would you know turn out to be um, but I also wanted to frame it into the context of what I was trying to say so that that's when the, the sort of like language comes into it so yeah um, I think There was a few times where, you know, we have a group chat with all the artists from Glitch season. <laughs> and I think um, there was a few moments in which the artists would just come by to see the show. And I think they said, like, for Priya's work, there was extra glitches. Yeah. <laughs> so it just happened on its own. <laughs> yeah. So it was slowing down the whole video and the audio more than I was expecting. I don't know if it really corrupted the, the, the projection <laughs> system, but yeah, it, it, it did corrupt the projection system. We had to reload the entire video again, um, and then it seemed perfectly fine. So every time it's playing, it's different, is it? Yeah, it, it, it gradually becomes different. It gradually slows down. <laughs> and it's, that, that is something that I didn't expect at all. So yeah. So like the data moshing is happening on the spot? Yeah. I But I haven't I checked it, like it yet, so I don't know what's the, out, the, the situation with the video work now. That's so cool. Yeah. I remember she was with me and she's like, yeah, I didn't do this. This just came out, like, these yeah. weird strikes. Yeah. yeah. It's wow. weird. <laughs> the real glitch. It was a real glitch. Um, I think today also, I know we spoke about this, um, but I think it's important to hear this directly from you. Do you feel that if somehow in the future our bodies no longer exist and we're all uploaded on the digital cloud, mm. um, kind of like a Black Mirror episode lah. So why do you think race or ethnicity would still matter? I guess our humanist aspect has always been so conditioned with our bodies. It's so hard to separate that human element 
um, from a body. So if you're going to have that sort of like uploading thing on a digital cloud, there's always this human input to it. Um, so it's very hard to remove the whole idea of race or ethnicity within it. Right. Yeah, it's just I, I don't think it's possible to completely erase that that two elements that mix us. I mean, the whole idea of race and ethnicity was brought because of what in historical evidence it was it was created to kind of like to create this division amongst us. So, and it's been stuck around for a long time. So I don't think it's going to be going away anytime. Um. From having these conversations, you know, like on the potential format of screen technologies and how they can help us complexify the understanding of our identities. Um, for Taisha and Sophia, that, that idea that Nora Lea's short film can act as a discourse to hard conversations surrounding our relationship to the land, um, how would you feel that the film will eventually become in itself, you know, an archival footage for the future? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I have to think. <laughs> I guess we don't know in the future what Singapore will look like, right? I want to raise, like, in my writing for the film, I use this word. You know how Singapore does reclamation? Mm -hmm. But in my, in my writing, I wrote that we will declaim the land. Yeah. And like my, it's not declaim like this is not my land. It's the idea of the opposite of reclamation because I see the act of reclamation as like an act of violence on the sea. Um, I feel like like Singapore as it is. I see Singapore as a country that tries really hard to be a city and forget that it's an island. And like I feel that informed a lot of my writing for the film. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But then I guess I hope that the words will say something about it. Like if we go back to becoming an island and I hope it's like, oh, it happened. Or if like we forget even more that we are an island, then basically my, my thoughts on it have been recorded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, with what we say in the film, we all speak our different languages and and I think that plays an importance on uh, sort of like you're putting back the importance of the language of the land because like like even now we're speaking the colonizers language and from my section in the film I said in Tagalog that like I feel sorry uh, for speaking and also uh, thinking in English um, all the time, so um, I think that really plays an importance. And maybe in the future, um, what I hope is to uh, for Singapore to maybe like reinforce the language, uh, our national language, um, so that so we have uh, we can so that we can remember our roots and and. Um, hold this uh, this culture close to our heart because I feel like we're so modernized and, and westernized um, we sort of like play into that colonizer's role instead of um, putting in the work to decolonize the land and take us uh, move us away from that past that we have in Singapore, yeah. So hopefully in the future, like, like, like we can be like our grandparents, like ordering food from all the stalls in all the different languages, like, oh. like speaking uh, Hokkien and Malay and Tamil, just everywhere. Yeah, I feel like that, that multilingual society is lost in our generation. So for you, like, it's important that we capture the multilingual thing that we have now in yeah. the film for the future. Yeah, I feel, yeah. Mm. Okay. 
I mean, you use the word decolonize as well. It's you know, this word has been a buzzword for the almost ten years. But you know, it's something. I guess, in theory, it's something that is very idealistic. But in practice, it's, mm. it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Um. I think, Tasha, you were also sharing this story about how. You know, you were writing the script with Nora, and you submitted something, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then it, it got us into the conversation about decolonizing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the story that I shared with Shahida was that um, when so we had like this word document to populate with our writing. So I wrote a piece that was, I think it started in formal Malay, and then informal Malay, and then English. But it's all different writings. Like it's a whole set of writing. Then when the finalized script came out, and Nora had like rearranged all our different inputs into like the final script, I was like, half of my writing is missing. Then I texted Nora. I was like, Hey girl, you didn't like the second half of my writing, is it? Not like that, lah. <laughs> no, no, don't like, ah. No, I was just like, ah, what happened to the second half of my writing, like? Are you not using it? Like it's fine if you're not. I'm just checking. Then she's like, "Huh? But I put the entire thing in already." I was like, "No le. Like half of it is missing." Then she went to check. She's like, "Oh my god! I just assumed the English part of your writing was the <laughs> translation of the Malay part of your writing." And I was like, thinking about it now, I'm just like, it's so often. That we assume that when we write in our mother tongues, we must make it translated for other people to understand. Yeah, and I remember speaking to you about like, but why, like, why do we feel that we need to translate ourselves? And like, I was reading this thing on Twitter lah that like, um, I think someone was saying like, why do people say nan bread or chai tea when nan means bread and chai means tea? And then someone was saying that like it's just because we already have a concept of what is bread. If we say nan bread, then we, it's like we are speaking about that specific type of bread, so it's easier for like us to identify which type of bread we are talking about. And then the person replied like, okay, but you don't say baguette bread or like <laughs> or like I don't know. Yeah, you don't say baguette bread, what? You don't say croissant pastry. So why is it that certain cultures need to translate or need to have a like little suffix to make sure people understand what we're talking about, and other cultures are just like we will work to understand them. Yeah, so I think that was the conversation that we had at some <laughs> point about that. Yeah, that was very funny, lah. That like my Malay text was put in but then the English text wasn't because so actually I don't know is there an ad of decolonization? Ah uh, she never used the English text. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What well, about you, Priya? Me? Yeah. Especially like, you know, when you're thinking about the future and, you know, our body not being able to exist and, you know, we're all living in our digital consciousness, like do you think we'll ever reach that um mode of being decolonized or whatsoever. The mode of being decolonized is a process. Um, like even for my works, I reference to white men, so like <laughs> my my forms of knowledge are still within the white academia or like white white referencing because like that's so what we are used to. But how do you use that knowledge and kind of like decolonize and, it. Yeah, yeah and try to like convey your own narrative without utilizing so much of the yeah. mm. so um, it's a process like you know just you know trying to subvert what we are so used to know so whether it's like white references or a very white location yeah it's just all about subversion mm. it's like I, like it's in a I'm trying to think so it's a bit like, like how you say like you in your work you are trying to reference Primavera but like with Singapore context. So it's like how do I just not even reference Primavera? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what you say. Yeah. Mm. Or even like our relationship with this space. Like, how do we relate to it? Like, how does my body relate to this space? Like, what does it do for me? Like, yeah. how can you like? not help me but like 
where can it bring me to? Yeah. Um, yeah, with it, with it, with it, sort of like historical <laughs> relation. Like, here am I sitting in this space talking about my work, talking about my experience. How does that matter? Right. Yeah. I think I want to bring up like a moment when we were shooting. Um, the five of us in our different spiritual practices and religions. Um, like before we, before and after we started shooting. Um, we came together and prayed for the space and to reach out to the spirits and to the building and to the land to sort of like ask permission and ask for like blessings so that we can use the space sort of take up the space that that they have built here so I think like yeah so yeah and um, yeah I think like that that little moment is very important to me and to feel like safe like prancing around the space <laughs> like in between shoots <laughs> yeah um, and to like to just sort of bring all our practices together in, in such an intimate sense um, uh, feels very nice and feels very um, like uh, ancient <laughs> yeah mm. Well, it's interesting though because you know when we talk about boundaries, you're also giving consent to what you cannot see by seeking their permission as well, mm. which is also an interesting way. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Something I want to mention about decolonization though is that we cannot go back to the past. Like we can, there's no way we can go back to like before we were colonized. So I don't think decolonization. Like this is my personal view that it should be us trying to go back to an ideal time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we have to figure out how to move on and come back into our own practices. So like okay now we all speak English, we all write in English, we all think in English. But now like last time when they came we couldn't talk back. But now we can. Mm-hmm. So like the ability to use the colonial language or whatever in order to talk back and like so they, they, you can't say you don't understand us. You can't say that we didn't know, so we thought they were okay. Mm. Now you cannot say you didn't know. Yeah. So for me, that is also an act of decolonization. Like it's okay that I speak English. Yeah, same mm. with the video work. Like how do I frame my narrative without giving away too much? Right, yeah. I try to get people to understand without, you know, saying certain words, you know, trying to, you mentioned unpacking it further. Yeah, so if, if I'm going to talk about race, can I eliminate, eliminate the word race and use some, some other, you know, words to replace that, what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I thought it was a very interesting process for me. Yeah. I think that is also something that um, I try to do because I also believe in how do we also um, think about the power of the image within our local, locality, our region as well and you know speak back in that language that they are so familiar with because you know the power of the image itself is something that has been um, understood differently and of course the ones that dominate the the conversations on the western forms of knowledge Mm. systems Um, I mean also for glitch season it's also like thinking about the potential of the screen technologies right Um, and I want to push that conversation a bit more further, like, um, and the role of the gays as well. I think we need to bring this up. Um, I think Priya, you shared about, you shared before about corrupting that gaze. Could you mm. expand a bit about it more? And for Taisha and Sophia, I think for all five of you in the film, that gaze was more confrontational. You know, yeah. So for me, the gaze, um, if you look into the wax work, it's more direct, it's more naive, but like in the f- other works, like um, the one that, that, that has the back turn right. or like even in the, the glitch video work, um, the gaze is it's not there, but it's a lot more intense and it's through the use of the body. So here the gaze exists in a, in a sort of like a language that is very different in space and time and it kind of like occupies within sort of like a poetic framework as well so yeah I also I, feel like you're sorry. kind of like disrupting that gaze like you're blocking it yeah. yeah yeah I mean I mean for me it's like how can I take the idea of gaze and 
put it into a sort of like a different language like without giving away too much like yeah we all know confrontational gazes yeah looking back at the viewer but how can we bring that gaze into a sort of like a different perspective mm-hmm. it's like yeah. if facial recognition technology doesn't want to recognize my face then yeah. you don't Just, need to look at yeah. it <laughs> oh my god yes yeah no. Sorry, Sophia, you yeah. were saying something? Uh, yeah. I, I just want to say, like, I feel that your work might be even more like intimate in a way that you allow the audience to see um, like that glitch parts of you and how like you break apart and, and um, come back together, but it is never like complete. Yeah, it's actually a very solemn experience when it when it's occupied with the audio. So it's very like I would say ambient, but very solemn. Mm. Yeah, almost yeah. very sad, but it's not sad. It's just very violent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the gaze. <laughs> <laughs> I think for you know for Nora Lia's, um short film. Yeah. Then it's quite obvious. It's more confrontational. You know? You're confronting an audience that you can't you can't see. Um, yeah, that's that's also very different. But you know, I think yeah. continuing from my previous point, for me, like, okay, yeah, definitely, like in camera knowledge, like you shouldn't be looking into the camera. Like, you know, when you're acting outside, they'll be like, here's your eye line is above the camera or next to the. Camera. You're never <laughs> supposed to look directly into the camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like. For me, like I'm just wondering, why is it? Why does it have to be confrontational? Mm. People are watching me, right? Mm. If I look back, why is there an act of confrontation? Like, are things just supposed to be done to me without me like having any say in them? You know what I mean, so like, I don't see the gaze back as a confrontation. It's just I'm doing the same thing that you are doing. Mm. If you see that as a confrontation, then I think like. Why not you, but like you in the general, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> but like, if someone sees that as a confrontation, then I think they need to ask themselves why. Yeah. yeah. I think um, the like all of us are speaking to the future <laughs> in a sense, and even now, in our present moment, is the future for when we filmed it. So, I think all the words and um, all the gestures that we did were direct um, purposely and like purposely to reach uh, out to the local audience mainly to like yeah reach to them through the eyes to the gaze like and the lens <laughs> yeah like <laughs> hear us you know yeah so it's like a way like a love letter to the future and something like a way to specifically speak to yeah someone. very sweet yeah love letter love letter <laughs> to the future yeah. <laughs> yeah I do actually have one question for Sophia like you know you are the youngest as you've mentioned <laughs> um, and you've, you've only just entered I mean you're you know you're still figuring yourself out, you just graduated and um, especially in these challenging times like, you know, how has it been for you as well? I think um, I think I've been very blessed and like to come and to start in this industry with um, people that make me feel safe like all of you and also like oh the, our collaborators um, <laughs> that like I can be surrounded with people with um, that I can have a common ground with and to share uh, stories and relate to also. So I think um, I I also came in a time into a time where we can have these conversations and feel empowered by it with each other, uh, and I think that's important for all of us and and empowering to me like as um, fresh as a freshie <laughs> so I just sort of started you know um, yeah <laughs> so just graduated also like um, I'm glad I just found a safe space with, within um, a community here <laughs> yeah I think, yeah, the conversations 
um, we've all had were very important mm. in in developing my own thought process also. Right. Yeah. I just realized that we are also all brown women. <laughs> Again, we populate the world. We just us. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm guessing we don't have any questions coming in for the public, but why? Is it because everyone's sleeping? <laughs> Same girl. But I do have one last thing also to ask you, um, all of you. Maybe um, I think this is really a general question, especially when you're talking about very hard conversations, um, and you know, bringing the arts into it as well. Um, the idea of the curatorial premise also came from the hate space for me of being in a pandemic, which translates into the glitch that we are experiencing, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is a trial of many to come. In the past year alone, we saw existing social issues that were taking time bombs, which then exploded during the escalation of COVID-19. Um, one of which is, of course, the discourse of race and systemic racism. Um, oftentimes, the conversation is still within that approach where the label of education comes from the minority lived experience. Um, how do you think we can move the conversation forward? Move the conversation forward by switching the way we speak about things or s switching our language, switching the choice of words. Um, yeah. Instead of making it very direct, oh yes, I want to talk about race, let's talk about something mm -hmm. that is not so direct. So it gives a lot more room to talk about other things. So yeah. in that sense, yeah, we can bring the conversation forward like that and include people that directly affect us. So not just within our own community, I guess, but yeah. yeah. I think when we were talking, I remember somebody said that there's a lot of artwork about being oppressed. But where is the artwork about being the oppressor? Yes. Where is the artwork that is a reflection of your role in the oppression. Yeah. Mm. Why I do see, we always yeah, have we, to we don't talk see about that. us? Yeah, yeah. I don't see that those who you know directly affect minorities, they don't talk about their role in playing that. And it's always about us speaking about it and yeah. then getting gaslighting, gaslighted <laughs> out of it. So, yeah. Mm. It's like, I don't know, maybe people who, they are not aware of like their role and they think like okay mm -hmm. I don't really have any like in-depth experience to talk about like race so I'll talk about like other frivolous things sure. ah, like I'll make <laughs> art for art's sake but like if you think about it if people are oppressed then there has to be someone doing it yes. whether consciously or unconsciously right yeah okay I have a question coming in by Jay Solomon oh my god Gerald hey girl <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing off the top back idea, are there issues that have floated to the surface amidst the introspection that the pandemic has forced onto us that you as artists wish to talk back on? Say again, huh? <laughs> huh? What? Introspection? Okay, bouncing off the top back idea, are there issues that have floated to the surface amidst the introspection that the pandemic has forced onto us that you as artists wish to talk back on? Um, during the circuit breaker, I think this is my first year as a freelancer. I graduated theatre school last year, and then I think in January I like really hit the ground running, like ex full on anxiety, like I have to prove myself. But then the circuit breaker hit, and then there was nothing to be done. And then like I couldn't say that I was a horrible artist or that like, I'm I'm a bad freelancer because I didn't have work. Like there was no work to be had. So during the circuit breaker, I actually learned my brain uncoupled productivity and self-worth. So this is something that has floated to the surface for me. That a lot of people tie their self-worth to how much output they put or how much impact they have on the world when actually just living to the next day to make a cup of coffee for yourself in the morning is a victory already. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is in my brain now. Yeah, yeah for me it was more of the financial aspect, like there was no money coming in, how am I going to make money? Girl. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was an emotional roller coaster. Um, yeah. yeah, not being able to produce works, not being, you know, getting paid for anything. It was such a sad period. Yeah. Hmm. 
And having to like graduate in this time is uh, confusing. And I think like finding out my next steps <laughs> I've been very confusing and I've been so indecisive. I'm like, should I do this or that? But also like the financial situation where like I should be earning and uh, let me tell you, this confusion never ends. Yeah, <laughs> never, <know. laughs> never ends. <laughs> yeah, um, but then, yeah, just having the little opportunities to create here and there, right. um, like kept me going. Uh, but other than that, it's been very confusing. <laughs> I mean, there were many times like I wanted to react to like. The, the things that were being done in Singapore, like for general elections or the migrant workers, like I wanted to react to that by producing something. But then like I was not in the capacity to do so. But I wanted to speak about these things. But I know it was gonna drain me. Mm -mm. So that well, that was another sort of like layer that we all had to deal with. Yeah. Where you had to pick your battles. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. I think like speaking on that, um, I feel like even though English yeah, English is the most accessible language for us to understand each other uh, and when we do talk back um, or when we do voice out um, our traumas and when they want to hear our traumas, um, it, it, um, they also sort of invalidate our words and our experiences like just because of who we are or because of our skin color or gender and and yeah like it becomes very tiring to to do that labor of like explaining why is it wrong and why why we had gone through the experience you know yeah and not everyone processes trauma the same way and yeah i think like switching up the conversation and how we speak about uh, problems is a good way to like move forward instead of reiterating experiences again and again even though I understand like a shared experience is powerful to to prove or uh, to be evidence for like injustice and discrimination um, but doing that labor of like explaining um, to every person you meet why something why why it hurts basically it yeah it becomes very laborious so yeah like as Tasha's favorite word not la <laughs> not la <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, do do you all have I think we should wrap up this should. Do you have any last things to say? No. Yeah. Um, thank you, Priya, Sophia, and Tasha for sharing with me. Um, and um, I hope these conversations do actually expand after glitch season. And I think comparing to the conversations like maybe five years ago, it's, I think we're moving somewhere, I hope. Yeah. Um, Thank you everyone for tuning in with us. Um, I believe you have come to the end of our talk and I hope you learned as much from the conversation. <laughs> Thank you for spending your morning now afternoon with us. Um, please also tune in for the upcoming artist talks in January and February. There will also be live on this channel and you can catch both exhibitions and exercise on meaning in a glitch season and time passes that are on view till 21st February 2021. We will also appreciate if you can take some time to fill in the feedback form using the QR code that was shown on the screen shortly. Thank you and have a great day.